The year is 1590. The place is North Berwick, a coastal town 20 miles from Edinburgh, Scotland's capital city. Today North Berwick is a sleepy, leisurely sort of place, a favourite with golfers and birdwatchers. But in the late 1500s, however, it was a hotbed of fear, paranoia and violence when it became the unhappy home to Scotland's first major witchcraft trial. So how exactly does a gentle seaside farming community become witchcraft central? Simple. The answer is Scotland's paranoid King James VI. We'll circle back to King Jamie later, but first let's meet an important principal character in this tale of accusation and bloodshed, a young woman by the name of Gilly Duncan. She worked in the house of the local bailiff. Gilly Duncan had a remarkable ability to soothe pain and cure diseases with herbs and other plants. She also had a habit of disappearing from the house where she worked by night. This was enough to arouse the suspicion of her employer, David Seaton, and in 1589 an event in the life of King James of Scotland roused Seaton's suspicions and paranoia further. The year before, on the 20th of August 1589, King James had married Anne of Denmark by proxy. Yes, that's right, King James sent a representative to Denmark to stand in for him at his own marriage. He was a busy man. George Keith, a Scottish nobleman, represented the king at the wedding, which ended with Keith sitting next to Queen Anne on the bridal bed to represent the consummation of the marriage. Who said romance is dead? <laughs> Next, Anne needed to be brought to Scotland. And what happens next? Well, this is where things get tense. The new queen and her entourage set forth in a fleet of ships, but danger threatened them every league of the voyage, and soon the fleet was scattered across the North Sea. Eventually, one battered boat after another began to arrive at the port of Leith near Edinburgh with news of a great storm that was so ferocious it seemed to have been conjured by the devil himself. Word arrived that Anne's ship had been so damaged by the storm that it and its occupants had been forced to land in Norway. The king set sail to find his bride and soon found his ship also beset by waves as tall as buildings and violent gusts of wind that threatened to capsize the vessel. Arriving in Norway, King James was looking for someone to blame and so it seems was the Danish court. Their beloved Anne had nearly been drowned. Someone needed to suffer for it. The finger was pointed at the Danish Minister for Finance, one Christopher Valkendorf. The Admiral, who had commanded the ship carrying Anne, claimed that Valkendorf had been so miserly in his equipping of the vessel that it had been unable to withstand the weather. Valkendorf was indignant. He was furious. He was also scared. An accusation of putting the Queen's life at risk could have nasty, nasty consequences for him. Luckily, he had the perfect retort. The ship would have been just fine if this had been a natural storm, he declared, but this terrible tempest was no feat of nature. It had been raised by witches living in the house of a local woman named Karen Vavers. They had hidden little demons in empty barrels on the ship, and once the ship was at sea, these demons had clambered around the ship and caused the storm. Another local woman, Anne Coldings, who had already been imprisoned on suspicion of witchcraft, well, she was questioned about this storm. Had witches caused it? Were Karen Vavers and her household guilty? Anne was asked this under torture. Yes. Of course, she replied. Five alleged witches, including Karen, were arrested, tortured, tried, and killed. By now it was 1590, with the Copenhagen witches defeated, Anne and James set sail for Scotland, but once again they were plagued by storms. King James's suspicious mind was roused. It seemed something or someone did not want the couple to reach Scotland. He suspected foul play. He suspected treason. He suspected witchcraft. He didn't expect the Spanish Inquisition. Upon his return to Scotland, his suspicions had grown so great that he could not rest and began trying to hunt down the witches in his kingdom with a terrifying indefatigability. But what does all this have to do with North Berwick and strange young Gilly Duncan? 
Well, her employer, the bailiff David Seaton, had heard about King James's bad luck at sea and his search for witches in Scotland. Something about all this talk of witchcraft had awoken a nagging thought in Seaton. Looking across the storm-tossed North Sea from sleepy North Berwick, David Seaton began to wonder, could his teenage employee, Gilly Duncan, with her strange herbs and natural habits, be a witch as well? Hmm. By November 1590, he had made up his mind. The girl was a witch and he must put a stop to her crimes against God, King and Country. Seaton and a group of his cronies seized a Duncan and set about trying to extract a confession from her. They tortured her with thumbscrews and used ropes to bind and burn Duncan's head. She would not confess to witchcraft and so the group of men set about trying to find a devil's mark on her body. They found a freckle or mark of some description on Duncan's neck, concluded that this was a mark made by the devil, and at this point, accounts claim that Gilly Duncan immediately confessed and declared herself to be a witch and in league with the devil. Whether this confession truly happened, it's impossible to say. The group of men may have simply made it up, or perhaps, perhaps Duncan confessed out of fear of what might come next, or caved under the pressures of the torture she'd already experienced. Duncan was carted off to the Tolbooth prison in Edinburgh where she was tortured further and is said to have named innumerable others in the community as witches, including an elderly woman named Agnes Sampson and a local schoolmaster named John Cunningham or Dr. Fian. Before long, these alleged witches were on trial. Between 70 and 200 of them, estimates do actually vary. And they had a special celebrity guest in attendance, King James VI himself. He'd been too busy to attend his own wedding, but he was damned if he was going to miss a witch trial. Many of the accused were tortured. Devices such as the witch's bridle were used. This was an iron device which forced sharp prongs into the mouth and could be used to keep an accused witch fastened to his or her cell wall. We know that many supposed witches also had their heads shaved, their fingernails forcibly removed, thumbscrews applied and spiked iron boots forced into their legs. After enduring all of that, many confessed to charges of witchcraft and were then strangled and burnt at the stake. All this is recorded in a pamphlet entitled News from Scotland, which was published in London the following year, most likely written by a minister named James Carmichael, the same James Carmichael who later assisted King James VI in writing demonology, King James's paranoid diatribe against witches, magic and the devil, which we discussed in an earlier episode of Spooky History. Check it out. So what came from the Berwick witch trials? Apart from more than 70 accusations of witchcraft, an unaccounted number of executions, the publication of a few fear-filled pamphlets and one very paranoid book, anything else? Well, the witch trials have had a lasting impact on culture in the British Isles. Ask any tour guide in Scotland. And glimmers of the events of 1590s can be found in Shakespeare's Macbeth, where in Act 1, Scene 3, the three witches describe raising a storm to torment a sailor whose wife has angered the first witch. Meanwhile, in more recent history, the literary and television series Outlander fictionalises and sensationalises the events of the North Berwick witch trials. But the people who were wrongly executed at the witch trials are also remembered in more sensitive ways today. Take a stroll up Edinburgh's famous Royal Mile, and in the shadow of the castle you'll find a small fountain, the Witch's Well. And yeah, it is a very small fountain. It has stood there since 1894, and is a tribute to all who were killed in the name of witch hunting. The Bronze Fountain features Hygeia, the Greek goddess of good health, and her father, Aesculapius, god of medicine. One depicted as terrifying, the other as benevolent. The plaque reads, this fountain, erected by John Duncan, RSA, is near the site on which many witches were burned at the stake. The wicked head and serene head signify that some used their exceptional knowledge for evil purposes, while others were misunderstood and wished their kind nothing but good. And there we have it, the North Berwick Witch Trials. How it happened, and how it was remembered. We hope you found this episode of Spooky History interesting and informative. If you want to know more about King James VI of Scotland and his spooky sorcery book Demonology, watch our Beginner's Guide to Witch Hunting episode. That's all we have time for today though, so goodbye for now, and uh, please, do have nightmares. Goodbye.